have the opportunity to hear from Pastor Lance. And then he's going to host a Q&A for us. So up on the screen, um, this is a website for anonymous questions. So go ahead and go to that website right now on your phones and put in this code. So you can enter questions in anonymously throughout the entire presentation uh, if something comes up. And please send in all your questions um, so that we can have a lot to discuss at the end of tonight's presentation. <clears throat> and then following the Q&A, there's snacks and things in the back, and we encourage you guys to stay in here and continue the conversation with each other um, as we finish up. And so finally, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Lance Lewis. Uh, he was born and raised in Philadelphia. He's been married to his wife, Sharon, for almost 34 years um, with his two children, Sarah and Charles. And he's the pastor of Soaring Oaks Presbyterian Church. And he has written a book called Heal Us Emmanuel, A Call for Re Racial Reconciliation, Representation, and Unity of the Church. So welcome, Pastor Lewis. Thank you, and thank you all. We appreciate you being here uh, this evening. I want to pray for our time um, and ask your indulgence a little bit because I'm getting over a head cold, um, but asking for God's blessing and presence with us now. <coughs> Father, we're grateful uh, to be here to talk about the unity of your church, the unity that Christ prayed for, unity that is such a key uh, to the witness of the gospel. So our prayer is that you would fill us with your spirit, and give us a desire to pursue and press toward a true unity so that we might see Christ glorified in every area of our lives and every area of our witness. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, thank you for that introduction, I really appreciate it. Uh, one quick clarification, I didn't make that clear last night. I contributed to the book, Heal Us Emmanuel, about 30 elders in my denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America, uh, decided to contribute to this book. And it's a really good book because it's not a how to do racial reconciliation. It's more of a why did this become important to me at a particular time in my life? So I would encourage you to pick that up if you get an opportunity. Why are we here talking about this issue tonight? I asked a very similar question around 26 years ago um, when someone was invited to speak to the college group that I had been part of. His name was Carl Ellis, Jr. And he was going to talk about Christianity, culture, and race. And I sat in the congregation that evening with those who were part of my college group that had been a part of that college group and they graduated from it. And I had the very same thoughts. Why is this necessary? What does this have to do with salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? And it was at that point that um, Carl, or as we call him, Yoda, he began to open our eyes and our minds to what God was doing in and through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he is actually bringing glory to himself and he brings glory to himself through his church. And one of the main ways he brings glory to himself through his church is he gathers people from all ethnic groups and brings them into a tangible unity whereby together we blend who God has made us, the gifts he has given us, the experiences that we've traversed, and that we show something beautiful, powerful, relevant, and sustainable to the world about actual unity. So what I'd like to do this evening is explain how we, by the grace of God, can continue to pursue that unity, perhaps even more necessary tonight in our time, why it's necessary for us to do so. First slide, please. So is Christianity the white man's religion? I gotta do this one. Do not fall off the stage. That <laughs> The evidence, dear ones, strongly suggests that it is. From the mid-17th through the latter 20th century, the Christianity practice in America, I'll call it American Christianity, was most definitely a white man's religion. 
By that I simply mean that for much of its presence in this country, the dominant white society embraced a kind of Christianity that above all things prized white supremacy and African-American inferiority. Moreover, they did so in the name of God, teaching that white supremacy and African-American inferiority was not simply something that you could see that was self-evident, as they would say, but it was God's direct, divine, and unchangeable will. Next slide, please. Let me give you a few examples of Presbyterians. I use Presbyterians for a few reasons. One, I'm a Presbyterian, so you kind of got to like pick on your own, as it were, and like air what we did. This is Samuel Davies, Presbyterian minister, who helped formulate much of our theology in America. And this is what he said when basically confronted with the growing institution of enslavement in the 18th century. He said, the appointments of providence and the order of the world not only admit, but require that there should be some civil distinctions among mankind, that some should rule and some be subject, that some should be masters and some servants. This theology, which began to formulate in the 18th century became or reached its flowering in the mid 19th century. Uh, next slide, please. So, once the Civil War broke out, there became a denomination named the Presbyterian Church of the Confederate States. And one of their churchmen, a man named James Henry Formwell, said this, and I want you to note. His biblical line of thought, this was not him cherry picking a few passages, but him saying, no, th this is woven throughout scripture. Notice how he said it. We stand exactly where the church of God has always stood, from Abraham to Moses, from Moses to Christ, from Christ to the reformers, and from the reformers to ourselves. We stand upon the foundation of the prophets and apostles, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We cannot forbear to say, however, that the general operation of the system, he's talking about enslavement, is kindly and benevolent. It is a real and effective discipline. And without it, we are profoundly persuaded that the African race in the midst of us can never be elevated in the scale of being as long as that race in its comparative degradation coexists side by side with the white bondage is its normal condition. So that's what he wrote at the dawn of one of the first assemblies of the Presbyterian Church of the Confederate States of America. You might have guessed by this time that the Confederate Presbyterian Church of the Confederate States of America lasted about five years. And then once the war was over, there was no longer a Presbyterian Church of the Confederate States of America because there was no longer a Confederate States of America. It did become known as a Presbyterian Church in the United States. So the large Presbyterian denomination split, and you had a large Northern Church, and then you had a large Southern Church. The large Southern Church that had embraced enslavement continued to embrace a racist theology. I say that because the denomination that I am part of now, the Presbyterian Church in America, comes from and came out of the Presbyterian Church in the United States. Next slide, please. As we moved past enslavement in the Civil War, at the dawn of, well, right before the dawn of the 20th century, a landmark case in the Supreme Court was argued, and the name of that case was Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy was a gentleman who was African American, and he sought to challenge Louisiana's law of segregation on rail cars. When he went to the first judge, the judge's name was Ferguson, hence the name Plessy versus Ferguson. Ferguson, Judge Ferguson, ruled in favor of the state of Louisiana. 
basically saying that we have the right to segregate all accommodations. It eventually went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court agreed with Judge Ferguson, and in so doing, entrenched and enshrined Jim Crow segregation as the law of the land throughout the 50 states. Now, it was most prominent in the South, but almost, if not every state in the Union, had segregation laws. When confronted with this reality, and with the reality that Africans appeared in scripture as equals within the sacred text with God's people, evangelical theology therefore made a sharp distinction between the people in the Bible who were clearly dark-skinned Africans from Kush, Ethiopia, and other places, and black peoples in America whom they deemed as Negroes. This then allowed conservative Christians to proceed with the belief that scripture was totally compatible with injustice, oppression, and partiality directed against African Americans who, from their perspective, had no place in scripture. What we find is the church following the lead of the culture and not scripture. Next slide, please. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but this is the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. It became one of the main references for conservative evangelical pastors and theologians concerning scripture. It wrote articles in which they explicitly said that yes, though you might see and read of black peoples in the Bible, they're not the black peoples in America. They're a different kind and type of black people, therefore you can safely continue to discriminate and oppress black peoples in America because we're still thinking that they're under the curse of Ham. Next slide, please. Plessy versus Ferguson came down in 1896. And for 60 years, the American church had the opportunity to search the scriptures and to answer the question, does scripture truly, actually, and really teach this permanent distinction in a dominant and subdominant dynamic? The test for their conclusion came with the landmark decision of Brown versus the Board of Education, argued by that man right there, Thurgood Marshall. Plessy versus Ferguson was overturned. Segregation was declared unconstitutional and illegal, and the states were told to proceed with desegregation with all deliberate speed. Upon hearing this, evangelicals reacted vociferously. Now I'm going to one of my Baptist brothers. For you, for you Baptists out there, you can, you can feel part of this now too. <laughs> Reverend Jerry Formal Sr., he started actually Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. His son is now the president of that institution. This is his response. If Chief Justice Warren and his associates had known God's work, and desire to do the Lord's will, I'm quite confident that the 1954 decision would never have been made. The facility should be separate. When God has drawn, when God has drawn a line of distinction, we should not attempt to cross that line. Reverend Fowler went on to say, integration will eventually destroy our race. So that was the response of conservative evangelicals. Next slide, please. This is the response of conservative Presbyterians. So Minister Gillespie, upon again responding to Brown versus Board of Education, spoke to one of the synods, I believe it was PCUS at the time, 
his words were so well received that they were made up into a pamphlet for distribution. And as you can see, the title of the pamphlet is A Christian View on Segregation. So six, nearly 60 years after Plessy versus Ferguson, when the country began to turn the corner on these things, American conservative Christians still were entrenched in their conviction that God had drawn an uncrossable line. And to cross that line was to step clearly outside of his will. Next slide, please. So, is Christianity the white man's religion? Well, the evidence is both overwhelming, and it cannot be ignored, minimized, or dismissed. One might even say that conservative American Christians totally recast biblical Christianity so that it truly became a white man's religion with its own theology. This theology, which I'll term domination theology, promoted the conviction that the God of Scripture favored a certain group of people solely on the basis of, quote unquote, race. Domination theology therefore led to the view that Christianity was indeed the white man's religion. That is a religion that promoted the religious, emotional, psychological, social, physical, and economic interest of white people above all other peoples. Now, though blacks and other minorities could become Christians, their true status before God was determined by whether or not they accepted a permanent subdominant status. Next slide, please. Of course, eventually, American conservatives relinquished their strongly held belief in enforced segregation, and for the most part, the inferiority of African Americans, women, and minorities. However, they never truly examined how they arrived at the conviction of God-ordained white superiority and minority inferiority. And because they never examined it, and they didn't study it, when it came time to begin to deal with these issues again in the country, rather than approach them with an assertive, robust, truly biblical theology, they imparted wholesale an ideological approach to the issues of race that began to be promoted by the Republican Party. They also began to switch from a view of God favoring white people per se to God favoring America. And thus, the centrality of America began to loom and grow large within American conservatives. Moreover, much of American Christianity never sought to pursue a genuine unity with the black church and other minority churches. What you found was a silence after segregation was ended and the country began to integrate more and more and to accept integration more and more. What happened among American conservatives is more and more they became silent and withdrew and never had an answer. And they never for the most part sought any type of repentance or reconciliation or unity. Because of that, they never learned the kind, one, of damage that was done for over three centuries of oppression, nor did they learn how God had worked among minority peoples and that they had an expression of faith that was both dynamic, vibrant, deep, and centered in Jesus Christ. One that could help any and all groups of people understand what God is doing and how to respond to the living God in suffering. One that could help all of us understand how to engage in mission work 
more fully and more faithfully. For the most part, that still hasn't happened, which is why, in my view now, there is a critical need for a witness, a genuine witness, that is truly biblical, Christ-centered, university-focused, and stresses genuine unity. <coughs> Next slide, please. Thank you. Where do we start? Well, we have got to break apart and make a distinction between redemptive and ideological thinking. Begin to think through the issues of race and ethnicity and unity redemptively instead of politically or ideologically. Ideological thinking moves us to view this issue of race and ethnicity as merely a social problem instead of a biblical issue. The challenge with the social problem is that we come at them with our ideological ideas, we never even step toward a redemptive view of them, and we never even try to interact with people that are struggling with and through them. Ideological thinking can also lead us to the conclusion that the removal of state-sponsored and culturally endorsed racism in the late 1960s actually put an end to racism, so that we can say, that was then, this is now, that's not my problem. If people think that they're subject to racist things, it's because they have chosen to live a victim mentality. They need to understand that that cannot happen. And when we do that, we violate a few things, first of all, when we say that, for the most part, racism cannot or does not really exist, we call into question our own publicized view of humanity. If we say that humanity and that people are born sinful in need of a salvation, but this say there's a category of sin that is they're not subject to, people will rightly call into question our view of scripture, and if we're simply using scripture to our advantage. What's more, when we say that racism was defeated in the 1960s, but as evangelicals we stood against it, what we're saying to the culture is when a culture has big, entrenched, difficult issues that they need to resolve, you need not call on evangelicals. If they can move through them then without evangelicals, what need do they have of us now? Does that mean that God was not at work throughout the civil rights movement? No, he most certainly was. God moved powerfully within and among the black church. Think about this for a, moment, for a moment. The black church sustained a multi-decade, non-violent, Christ-centered protest movement against their very humanity coming up against vicious demonic attacks Attacks such as locking people on a bus and setting that bus on fire. They did that without lashing out in a violent manner and actually offering forgiveness to those who attacked them. That is the living God at work. Now, think about this. What might God do? If he could do that, and he did do that, what might God do if his people humbled ourselves and in repentance came together and said that it's not our ideological views that we're going to champion, but it's the redemptive kingdom of Jesus Christ. And our calling is to work together 
to highlight that kingdom and that king. When thinking ideologically, we do tend to view the USA as the center of God's work regarding unity instead of his church. And so even today, we'll speak about the opportunities that minorities have, the progress that minorities have. Many times we don't speak of the actual relationships we have with minorities and their actual presence within our groups. Understand something, they make their dish, and they must use each of four ingredients found in the box. So, they can use plums, bread in a can, some kind of pistachio paste, and whatever that stuff there is in the bowl there. <laughs> it's awesome. And they've got to be creative, they have to make it taste good, and they have to plate it well. Now there are two things you need in order to at least even make it on to chop and hope to compete. First and foremost, you have to use all of the ingredients in the basket. You need each ingredient in the basket. If you decide, I have no idea what canned pistachio paste is, what it tastes like later for it, you will be chopped. Unless your competitor makes raw chicken and throws it in the face of the judge. <laughs> They've got three um, judges who are um, restaurant tourists. You, you have to understand that you need every ingredient in the basket. And it doesn't matter how disparate the ingredients are. You've got to find a way to make it work. Dear ones, we have been given a faith that connects us with the living God in such a way that we need one another to carry out our main mission, which is the witness of the gospel. We cannot move forward with that mission with the idea that I don't need this part of the body. If we continue to do that, God will still be at work in carrying out his mission. He simply won't do it through us. Now there's another ingredient that you need on chopping. This is an ingredient you need even before you get on the shelf. You have to love cooking. No, no. You have to love cooking. You literally have to, using the metaphor, eat, sleep, and drink cooking. You've got to go on a show where you're going to get four ingredients that are completely unrelated, and you've got to make something that is slamming in 30 minutes, and not cut your finger off while you're doing so. Because you can't serve blood on the plate, that's bad form. <laughs> Every chef that they interview Every chef that they ask why you're here, what comes out is, I love this. We've been told by our Lord to live for us and then die for us that we're to love one another. Loving one another means that I mourn with those who mourn. That I don't tell them that they shouldn't mourn. That I don't question the cause of their mourning. That I don't scold them because they're mourning. That I mourn with them. We also rejoice with those who rejoice, even if what they're rejoicing over, from my perspective, doesn't really matter much to me. My first time in the San Diego area came last April. It was the last weekend of April. And I was participating in a um, missions conference called Witness at a church in Fullerton. Um, we actually got down to San Diego first and spoke at Westminster Seminary, which is where I met Tyler. Um, so that's why I'm here tonight. So if you don't really like this, it's Tyler's fault. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, the conference was held at a Korean church 
in Fullerton, California, parking lot. And it was during that last weekend of April that North Korea began to show signs of really wanting to talk and negotiate and maybe have some openness. And as word began to get around that this was happening and as the news outlets were reporting it, I could see that many of my Korean brothers and sisters were visibly moved. Those who were speaking got up and began to talk about it and what it might mean. That was not my time to say, well, you know, this, this, come on, this is just propaganda. It's, it's just the news. It's, you know, what does it have to do with the last one? <laughs> they were rejoicing in hope. And so I rejoiced in hope. Because we're part of one body. Being a part of one body means that I am called to love them. What might love look like as I close in this context? Well, first, we need to lament what has happened. Not just to African Americans, we certainly do. We understand the gravity of what has happened. We need to lament what has happened to Christ's church and Christ's witness and how it did affect African Americans. To lament is simply to say, I am going to sit with you in your grief, your pain, your trauma, and I'm going to refuse to scold you for that grief, pain, and trauma. When you bring up an issue that hurts you, even if it occurred, halfway across the country, I am not going to dismiss it, minimize it, belittle it, or change the subject or act like it doesn't have anything to do with the gospel. I cannot say that I serve a God who I believe in the Word says cast all of your cares on Him, but then tell you that there's some of your cares that simply don't matter. Lamenting says, I know that God is walking with you through this time, and through the struggle, and through the deepness of your pain. And I am your brother and your sister, and I'm going to walk right there with you in silence, and in grief, and in mourning, and in encouragement, and in prayer, and in support. Let me explain to you one thing, and I try to explain this to, to, to a number of people. When you hear African Americans talking about issues of race, of injustice, of impression. We're not simply looking to give information or to lay a guilt trip. So many times it is a way of expressing our lament. And when someone is expressing a lament, the biblical call is to follow what the Apostle Paul told us in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, to mourn with those who mourn. The next one we can love one another is to listen, to be willing to hear the stories of those. And when an issue comes up like this, is Christianity the white man's religion? Rather than sort of have a knee jerk reaction, listen, investigate, find out, learn. Be willing to sit in a space that perhaps is psychologically and emotionally uncomfortable. Be willing to hear information that, yes, it might change your perspective on some things. But listen. A friend of mine, Dr. Alexander John, he's a professor at Tula Pacific University. Dr. Jung worked on a paper that my denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America, did, by the way, by the grace of God, um, several years ago, almost two decades ago, we repented for our part um, in promoting slavery. We were thankful for that. And a few years ago, we repented for our part in promoting segregation as a denomination. Out of that grew a desire
to put, as you would say, meat on the bones of our resolutions of repentance. And so, led by Kevin Smith, um, a pastor in my denomination in Chattanooga, Tennessee, they formed a committee. When, when Presbyterians want to do something, they form a committee. It's, it's just the quick lesson in Presbyterianism, how do we hear from God? We form a committee. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true, we form a committee. We say, what is God saying on this issue for us right now? We get that from Acts 15. In the committee, they take time to study. This committee took two years to study it. And they came out with a wonderful report on race, racial reconciliation, and unity. Dr. John, along with the rest of the committee, he, they presented this paper to our General Assembly this past summer. And one of the things he said during his part of the presentation was this. When minorities tell you their story about racism, Listen to them. It is not the time to challenge, or to scold, or to dismiss, or to become defensive, or to minimize. It's the time to listen. Lastly, learn. Take the time to read, to listen. If you don't already, I would really encourage you to listen to a podcast called Truth's Table. There's another one called The Witness or Pastor Mike. There are a plethora of books that, that you can have access to. If you want to, just give me an email. I'll give you a place to get started. Take the time to learn of what and how God has moved through minority groups in his will and his providence as they have had to seek him in the face of tremendous oppression. Learn a different perspective on these things that, oh, granted, maybe you don't agree with, but learn them anyway. Because it's for the sake of our witness.